Okay, so if I say to you the word dearth, what do you think about? I guess you think, think about enlargers, dark room equipment, etc., etc. But it might surprise you to learn that Durst actually made four cameras and they're particularly of interest to camera collectors like us because they were interesting, they were innovative, they were individual, they were eccentric. There was four of them and not one was like the other three. What's more, they started making them two years before they made their first enlarger. So, where did it all start? Well, it started here. This is the Italian Tyrol. It's an area of northern Italy right on the very border with Austria, so much so that most of the people who live there are bilingual or talk a kind of patois, which is a mixture of Italian and German. And I visited there many years ago because I visited the Durst factory, and you find that all the shop signs and all the street signs are in two languages, and even the towns have two names. This one is a Bressanoni Brixham, the Bressanoni part obviously being Italian and the Brixen bit being uh, the Austrian or the German word in there. And this is where it started with these two brothers. On the left, we have Julian Durst, who was born in 1909, lived in 1964, and attended the uh, Technical Academy in Constance. On the right, we have Gilbert Durst, who was born in 1912, died in 2004, I met him, um, trained at a photo, uh, at a renowned photo shop in Innsbruck. They were both interested, fascinated in photography right from an early age because uh, their mother was a photographer. There was a dark room in their house from right from, from the, when they were babies. Um, so in 1929, they opened a business to repair photographic equipment in their own home. And so successful was it that in 1936, they set up Durst Phototechnic to manufacture photocopies before moving on to their first camera, which had been their dream to start with. Um, this is a very early um, picture of the Durst factory. I don't think it would have been like this immediately um, they opened it. They probably uh, got round to it being this big later on. But this is quite an early look at what the Durst factory looked like. And it was here then that they made their first camera. Which, they, which is called the Gill, which now is a strange name for a camera, as you must admit, but it could stand for a number of things. There are those who said it stood for, you know, I don't speak Italian, but I have the accent, the Gioventu Italiana del Littorio, which was the youth movement of the Italian National Fascist Party. But I think it might be a lot nicer if we thought it was named after Gilbert Durst. Um, either way, it's a strange name for a, for a camera. It is, as you can see, a fairly standard, bog standard box camera, although being Italian, it's got perhaps just a little bit more style than some. All its functions, as you see, were on the faceplate, and they were printed in Italian, German, English, or Swedish, according to the country into which it was being exported. I've only ever seen an Italian one, and very, very few of those, as I will show you later. Um, looking at it a little more closely, here we are. Um, there's the face plate on the front with all the instructions in Italian. It's got a 10.5 centimetre f11 to 6 uh, uh, lens, which will stop down to 16. It's got shutter speeds of 1 of a second and B. Um, I actually, uh, not speaking Italian, got all those bits of Italian on the face plate and keyed them into Google Translate. So uh, the first one at the top there, Chiarissimo Alta Montagna. Anyone who speaks Italian, I do apologise. I mean, very clear or high mountains. Then we have Alla Perto Chiaro, which is clear outdoors. Interior Retrati Int, whatever. Interior Internal Portraits. And Eterni Alla Perto Caperto. Indoors, outdoors were covered. And Neve al Mare was snow or sea. So all, you can see various conditions and light conditions, which only allowed you to set either F11 or F16. Um, here it is from the side, um, not particularly interesting, other than the fact that unusual for a camera of this type uh, and age, it has actually got an interlock between the, uh, the shutter and the film wide. This is the shutter button down here, which you press in, and it, as it takes a picture, it stays in until you wind the film. So no double exposures there. Here's the back of it, which is not particularly interesting, but it had the usual red window. Inside, you'll notice that there's a curved film path, as there was in so many of these cameras of this age, 
which compensated for aberrations in the lens. And it shot eight exposures, six by nine centimetres on 120 film. Um, there's also a rare brown face version of the gill, which I have never seen other than in a picture. And this I found on the internet and contacted the guy who was running the web page. His name is David Cavallaro. Uh, so he allowed me to use this, and you'll see a few of these pictures coming up in a minute. Um, later on, this one arrived. So basically, in 1942, Durst stopped camera production uh, when the factory turned its attention to making items for the war effort. Um, but in 1950, a large Italian photographic dealer commissioned a clone of the gill, which he called the Roto Juve, Juve, I don't know, but you can see it on the front there. Basically, it's the same camera. So there we go. That was their first camera. Now, camera number two, coming in 1947, and it was the Duca. Here's an advert for it over here. And here is the actual camera. Um, I photographed the one on the right. And funnily enough, it's almost a clone of the picture uh, in the advert. So it's the Duca, or maybe it should be called the Durka, because uh, the name comes from Durst Camera. It's got a fixed aperture f11 lens with two focus settings, one for 3 to 10 feet and one for 10 feet to infinity. It's got shutter speeds of a 30th of a second, um, but that is identified only as I for instantaneous, and it's got time exposure, and it's got double exposure prevention. Uh, it's quite a neat little camera. Um, it looks like a sub-miniature, and it's this, very much the size. If I put it side by side with a Gertz Mini Cord, which is a 16mm camera, you can see they're around about the same sort of size. But it is, in fact, a 35mm camera. So if we take the side off, as you can see there, two cassettes slot uh, slot in top and bottom and if you look carefully at the cassettes you'll see they have the Gavert name on them and that's because the cassettes were actually made for the Ape of Carat which went out to uh, style round about that sort of time um, and Durst resurrected them to put them in the Duca camera. There was enough uh, in a cassette for 12 exposures the full frame 24 by 36 millimeter and once again you can see it's got quite a quite a radical curve to the film plane to compensate for the lens. Uh, here it is from the side. So we have this lever here, which you push down to advance the film. And as you do so, the frame counter advances by one frame. Uh, so neat, quite a neat little camera. Um, there was also, I understand, an F8 version, which is identified by the fact that it's got one to eight on the top there. And again, I found this on uh, David Caballero's uh, website, and you're able to use it. Um, so that's, that's, that's quite rare. Um, also, there were coloured versions. There's the black version, which I have, the red and green version. I think there was also a blue version, there might have been something else. Here's a little roll of film actually made for the Duca. These pictures come courtesy of a very good friend that I've never met called Holger Schultz, who lives in Australia and has got a fantastic website called Cameras Down Under. If you've never heard of it, look up Cameras Down Under from Olga Shaw and see what amazing collection he's got. So, so that's the Duca. Right, next up comes 1956 and comes the Durst 66, which is made of aluminium, um, making quite light, actually. When you pick it up, you expect it to be heavy. Um, I don't know if it's ugly or if it's pretty, when I first saw one of these things, I thought, what an ugly camera. But I had to have it because I was trying to get all the Durst cameras. But, but, I, but it's, it's grown on me over, over, the, over the year or so that I've had it. Um, so it's, well, it's quite pretty. Let's look at it from the top. So um, it's got two apertures there marked as a red mark and a white mark. The red one is F8. The white one is F11. And Durst recommended you use the red one for colour film and the white one for fast monofilm. It's also got an extinction meter window, which is indicated for shutter speeds for one to two hundredth of a second. So if you look at these four little windows here, one, two, three, four, as you point the camera towards your subject, as just with any other extinction meter, they light up according to the light. And when you see the last one alight, you turn the shutter speed dial here to match up to that window which also gives you um, a pictogram there for weather, a description of the type of subject. 
Um, and so the aperture is fixed depending on whether you use that one or that one, and the shutter is indicated by the extinction meter. Okay, now the other strange thing about it is the shutter itself, which is a little unusual. This is the patent for it, um, which is, uh, well, it's as easy to understand as most patent drawings, and if you delve into the patent itself, you really have to concentrate. But what it comes down to is this. As you wind the film, it pumps air into a small cylinder inside. The cylinder is covered by a plate in which there are a series of different sized holes. As you set the shutter speed, you turn that dial, it also moves the plate uh, across the mouth of that cylinder, positioning a different hole according to the shutter speed. As you press the shutter release, the air is allowed to escape from the cylinder through one of the holes. So pressing the shutter opens it as the air escapes, so when it's all gone, it closes again. Large holes, of course, allow the air to escape quickly, resulting in fast shutter speeds. Small holes allow the air to escape slowly, resulting in slow shutter speeds. So there's a very strange camera with a very strange shutter, and I'm surprised that never really caught on. If we look um, at the back of the camera, it's got a twin control here. On the right-hand side, it twists around to open and close a flap over the little red window. So you can see that rotates there. Um, on the other side, if you rotate it, that unlocks the back of the camera, which opens, shows you that it's taking six by six pictures on 120. And once again, it has that slightly curved film plane to correct aberration, which seems to be something that Durst were quite keen on. Now, the story goes that in 1944, during the latter years of World War II, a German bomber was shot down close to the Durst works and among the wreckage strewn around the crash site, Julius Durst discovered a tiny instrument controller. Now, the intended use for this is unclear, but it appears that Julius took it away for analysis and the mechanism led him to create what turned out to be the world's first automatic aperture priority camera. And it's this. It's the Durst Automatica, uh, and it arrived in 1956. And as you can see, it's a very nice, sleek camera. It's, uh, it's Durst's first 35mm camera, actually. And the way it works, when this little lever here is set on O, as, it, as you see there, you have manual operation with shutter speeds of 1 to 300 of a second and apertures to f2.8 to f22. But if you set the lever... You turn it round onto the A setting there, it, and then you set the lens, or rather the shutter dial, to 300 automat. This now gives a form of aperture priority. And the way it works is this. If we look at the top of the camera, the film speed setting dictates the aperture. <clears throat> so as you set the film speed, that's the aperture, and that's the only one you're going to get. So there are the various apertures uh, according to the um, film speed well, read them all, you can see them there for yourself. Um, pressing the shutter button releases a meter needle that activates the mechanism inside, and you can see the meter needle which runs across there. And um, there again is the pattern drawing for this, which again is a little incomprehensible. So, just let me say the shutter mechanism works much like the one on the Durst 66, except that by instead of changing the holes in that plate over the top of the tube by turning the shutter speed, it's turned automatically um, as the needle advances and retracts uh, on, the, on the exposure meter. So it is actually, I think, and if somebody tells me otherwise, the first aperture priority camera, except the apertures are a little bit restricted. <laughs> the controls are really nicely recessed into a very smooth top plate. See how this... Um, the wind lever is absolutely flat the top plate and it only rises slightly as you advance it. Same with the uh, rewind knob. That's flush until you press the rewind button on the bottom of the camera when it pops up ready for rewinding. Uh, opening the back of the camera. This is now the first Durst camera to take st standard 35mm cassettes. And as you'll see, there is no curved film plane this time, so they got it right at last. So there we are. There's an advert for it. Um, it's it's rumoured that Durst might have developed a prototype of this camera, 
which they were going to call the EW Automatica, and it would have had both a rangefinder and interchangeable lenses. But so far, I can find no evidence that the camera ever went into production, and so far, obviously, I've not managed to find one. So there we are. There's, that's Durst. The camera manufacturing business closed in 1963 when they stopped making the, the Automatica. So all I need to say to you now that is when I say Durst to you, don't just think about enlargers and darkroom equipment. Remember, they also made four really nice individual and unusual cameras as well.